Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, so this is a session on protocols and our first talk will be on optimal broadcast encryption and CPAB from evasive lattice, lattice assumptions by Hutak V. And Hutak is also the one giving the talk. All right, uh, thanks for coming. So uh, I'm going to start my talk with my uh, slides from uh, the EuroCrypt 2013 RAM session. So imagine you're interested in doing online dating and if you use a user that uh, you know, joins the website and the first thing you do on the dating website is to create a profile that contains all sorts of sensitive information about you, like your hobbies, you know, um, et cetera, et cetera. And the first thing you come to mind with concerns about your privacy is that you want to limit access uh, to your profile. So ideally to people who satisfy your dating criterion, which could be something simple like a simple and or a bit more so sophisticated DNA formula. So when other users uh, join the system, other users are associated with what we call attributes. And uh, when they join the website, they get secret keys that are tailored to the attributes. And the uh, with the uh, the correctness requirement is going to say that if you have a key for attributes that matches the uh, access policy, you should be able to decrypt the message and see the profile. And for anyone else who uh, with attributes that don't satisfy the access policy, they should learn nothing whatsoever about the uh, message. And moreover, this should be the case even if there's a collusion. If uh, you have an adversary that gets hold of multiple secret keys. This is exactly the notion of attribute-based encryption, or more generally, ciphertext policy attribute-based encryption, where uh, the sender has a policy F and wants to encrypt a message M with respect to the policy to get a ciphertext. Secret keys are associated with uh, bit string X that specifies the attribute. And the basic correctness again says that uh, if uh, F of X is zero, you should learn the message. And correctness says that if F of X is not zero, you should learn nothing whatsoever about the message, even, there's a, even if there's a collusion. Right? So the main punchline from uh, my previous EuroCrypt talk is that we can actually construct attribute-based encryption schemes for our circuits. So the uh, policy F can be any circuit from the uh, standard LW learning with errors assumption which basically says a given random matrix A as A plus E to the random. And this talk, I'm going to use a squiggly underline uh, as a shorthand for plus noise. Okay. Uh, and this result actually immediately implies uh, what in this, I guess in this talk, is called a ciphertext policy ABE, CPABE for circuits, where the ciphertext size is very large. It's going to be as large as the circuit size of F. So if you're a practitioner, you'll be concerned with the large ciphertext size. And in the, this was a question addressed in a series of recent works where they try to get CPAB for circuits with sublinear ciphertext size. So polynomial depth of the circuit. You should think of the depth of the circuit as roughly logarithmic log of the size of the circuit. So this is a much smaller ciphertext size. Unfortunately, these results are not quite from the LW assumption anymore, but from our stronger assumptions. Uh, let me just say that one interesting thing about these line of works is that they immediately imply uh, optimal broadcast encryption scheme where the total ciphertext public key and secret key size is polylogarithmic in the total number of users, capital N in the system. So, uh, right. so a bit more about this uh, recent work. So the first of these results achieve CPABE uh, for circuits uh, from out of and pairings and only for small depth circuits, what's called NC1, so log depth circuits. And the second of these works uh, gives you uh, users only lattices, but they, it's actually a heuristic scheme in the sense that uh, they, they don't have, they don't provide a security reduction to a simpler uh, uh, lattice assumption. So the uh, main punchline for this new work is a new CPAB for circuits with small ciphertext from new lattice assumptions. And as an immediate corollary as with prior works, we get optimal broadcast encryption from these new lattice assumptions. In the rest of this talk, I want to give you a sense of what the new construction looks like. And uh, as a warm up, the starting point are the, this following what we call the matrix key equation underlying uh, all of the uh, prior uh, ABE schemes from the LW assumption. It basically says that if you're given A minus X tensor G on the left, which you think of as a shorthand for uh, uh, AI minus XI Gs, you can uh, derive from this quantity AF minus F of XG, where uh, AF is a matrix with the same dimension of AI. In particular, it's going the matrix, the sign of the matrix AF is going to be much smaller than the sign of the circuit. And that's something we're going to be using. 
So here's roughly what our scheme is going to look like. In our master public key, we're going to put in there this very uh, wide matrix A. So the width of the matrix A is going to depend on the length of X, but independent of circuit size roughly. Uh, then the, the CAM, which we use to mask the message, is going to be an LWE sample with respect to A sub F. It's going to be small. And the product of the ciphertext and the secret key is going to be an LWE sample with respect to uh, A minus X tensor G. So correctness, oh sorry, even before that, how do we get to this uh, product relation? Uh, we decompose this product as follows. So the ciphertext is going to be an LWE sample with respect to some random matrix B, which is part of the master public key. And the secret key is going to be a Gaussian pre-image of the uh, target matrix A minus X tensor G with respect to this uh, matrix B. Mm -hmm. So uh, right then you can see that if you take the product of the sample and secret key, you get the expression from before. And correctness is fairly straightforward using the uh, matrix key equation. And in, the, in this scheme, with just a bit of tiny tweak, you can show that this scheme is secure under the LW assumption if the adversary only sees one secret keys. Okay. But in general, in CPABE, we are concerned in the setting where the adversary, we have to deal with collusions where the adversary potentially gets multiple secret keys. And it's also easy to see that this scheme is insecure if the adversary gets two secret keys. Essentially, because the adversary gets multiple equations in the same LWE secret, and it will be able to uh, recover basically the LWE secret S. So the way uh, the previous uh, constructions get around this attack is to design the scheme so that uh, when you take the product of the ciphertext and the secret key, you get different LWE secret SI, okay, SI for the I secret key. Uh, concretely, in the BV scheme of Prakoski, Bakuntana, then uh, SI is going to be of the form RI times the matrix S, where RI is going to be a essentially random low norm uh, vector that comes from the secret key, the I secret key. So you pick a fresh R uh, every time you generate a new secret key. And this matrix S is going to be the encryption randomness. It's sort of a souped up version of the uh, LWE secret S. Okay, so to implement this idea, so we will want to uh, uh, we want to design CPAB scheme with the property that the product of the ciphertext and the secret key is of the form uh, R times X times A minus X times G. The difficulty of doing this is that you have this term uh, S that depends on the ciphertext sandwiched between two terms that depend on the secret key, whereas you want ciphertext times secret key. Right? So the way they uh, implement this in a BV scheme is a very clever idea where they use some techniques from uh, identity-based encryption. Uh, in this work, we take a rather different approach and we uh, make use of the following matrix identity, which comes from, uh, if you know this thing called vectorization is very related. What this matrix identity say is that if you, instead of working with the matrix S, you work with the flatten of S, which corresponds to a very wide row vector you get from concatenating the uh, every row of S, then you can actually move S from the middle to the left-hand side. And R will move to the right-hand side, but with an extra tensor. Okay. Now, the nice thing now is you have something that depends on the secret key on the left-hand side, uh, on the left part of the product, and then something that only depends on the secret key on the right side of the product. So they decomposes nicely into a ciphertext and a secret key. So ciphertext is again going to be a out of sample with respect to B, except the secret now is now the flattening of S, and the secret key is going to be again Gaussian pre images with respect to some matrix B. And uh, right, putting this together, we get the following very simple uh, CPAB scheme for circuits. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, there's no attack on the scheme. But the question in this talk we want to address is, uh, can we actually prove anything about the scheme? OK, very well. Uh, so the first thing we're going to try to do uh, towards uh, proof of security is try to prove something a little bit simpler. So the first step, let's try to prove that the uh, product of the ciphertext and the secret keys are jointly pseudo-random. If you can prove such a theme, uh, you can. If you can prove such a statement, you essentially rule out at least the uh, attack that we described earlier. But on the scheme, when you get two secret keys, and so let's try to prove this. So, uh, as first starting point, uh, observe that by the LW assumption, if you uh, R i times s is pseudo random. So R i, remember, is the randomness that comes from the i secret key. And uh, again, uh, you, with this expression, if you multiply both sides of the equation by a low norm matrix, uh, it continues to be pseudo random. You need low norm because this matrix is interact with the error in uh, Ri plus S. Okay, so Ri times S, so this is pseudo random as long as uh, A itself has low norm. And then A minus X times I is low norm. And then on the right hand side, you now have independent out of secrets SI. So now you can do a hybrid argument. And from the out of assumption, you get that the uh, expression on the right hand side is also pseudo random. 
So this pretty much proves what we wanted to uh, achieve in step one, except we have uh, A minus X tends to I instead of A minus X tends to G. So we have to go back to our matrix key equation to make sure that it still works when you replace the gadget matrix with the identity matrix I. And turns out it does, except you pay a price, you get this, uh, you get a much bigger error growth, which is a doubly exponential in the depth of the circuit instead of singly exponential. And when you translate it to an ABE scheme, this means that your cipher and your secret key size is going to be exponential in the depth of your circuit instead of polynomial in the depth of the circuit. So uh, as an ABE for circuit, it's not terribly interesting because we already knew how to get uh, cipher text size that depends on the size of the circuits, but it's sufficient for optimal broadcast encryption, which corresponds to circuits with extremely small depth. So if you have N users, the size is N and your depth is W logarithmic in N. So when you do two to the depth, you get uh, poly dot n, which gives you uh, optimal broadcast encryption. Okay. So that's for now. Uh, for now, let's give up on circuits for a moment and just try to get optimal broadcast encryption. So, so far, so good. Uh, and this is roughly what the cipher and secret key is going to look like. As the next step, we want to go from showing the product of the ciphertext and the secret key pseudo-random to showing that the ciphertext is pseudo-random given the secret keys. That gives you one step towards self-proving security of the scheme. And uh, our intuition for this is that such a statement should in some sense follow from what we proved in the first step for the following reason. If you look at what the cipher tag looks like, it's essentially an LWE sample. So our intuition is that if you are trying to distinguish some LWE sample as P plus E from uniform, and you're given some Gaussian pre major P in birth with respect to some target matrix P, um, really the only interesting distinguishers are the one that take this uh, SP plus E and B inverse of P, multiply, multiply them together to get a new out of E sample uh, SP plus E prime and try to distinguish SP plus E prime from uniform. In the case of our scheme, when you take this product, you be, the SP, uh, S times P corresponds to the product of the cipher and the secret keys, which we know from step one to be pseudo-random. Therefore, from that, we, you know, if this, if this is indeed the only attack, then it will imply that the cipher is pseudo-random given the keys. And this is, uh, and we formalize this intuition uh, by a new lattice assumption, which we call the evasive LW assumption, which is also independently introduced in the work of uh, Rotem Saburi. And the assumption basically says that if you some uh, distribution P, which corresponds to this A minus X tends to G tends to R, uh, if SP plus E and SP plus E is pseudorandom, then SP plus E should be pseudorandom given these Gaussian pre images. Okay. And this should hold even if also you get the B and the P's uh, as standard in the LW assumption. All right. So let's try to uh, pass this assumption a bit. Uh, the assumption refers to essentially any, distrib any distribution B, P that's independent of B, but let's look at two concrete examples of our distributions uh, P as a sanity check. Okay. Uh, if P is a uniform distribution, then it's fairly too easy to see that both the pre and post condition are true under the LW assumption. Okay. The precondition just because P is random, the post condition because B inverse of P looks like a random Gaussian, so you can just sample it yourself without needing a trapdoor for B. On the other hand, if P is a gadget matrix, then both the pre and the post conditions are false. You can, in, you can recover as from uh, S3 plus E. So false implies false, so that's consistent with our evasive LW assumption. So that's our examples. And uh, let me just say that the precondition requiring pseudo-randomness of this uh, product is, uh, basically allows us to avoid zeroizing attacks in the literature on uh, multilinear maps and uh, IO candidates. All right. Uh, okay, for our actually scheme, we actually need a uh, slightly souped up version of the assumption where we get some additional matrix A prime coming from some distribution, but this is mostly technical. Okay, so at this point, uh, we got pretty close to proving security of the scheme. Uh, we basically proved that the cipher is pseudo random if you don't have the chem key. Uh, unfortunately, if you put the chem key back, the proof breaks, uh, essentially because when you do this, when we try to this apply out of E with the assumption of R i times S, now this S applies somewhere else, so you get into trouble. Um, so the way we fix this is we are going to mask the chem key with additional out of E sample. And this essentially allows us to make sure that the leakage is of the from R i times S, and then you can do the same argument from before. So once you make the chem a bit more complicated, you're going to have to introduce extra terms in the ciphertext and the secret key so that uh, they can cancel and you get correctness. This is essentially our final scheme. And uh, 
what we show about this scheme is that under the uh, evasive out of way assumption and the out of way assumption, uh, this scheme is indeed gives you an optimal broadcast encryption scheme with poly logarithmic size parameters. And uh, moreover, if you uh, take this identity matrix and uh, move it back to the gadget matrix, you also get a uh, compact CPABE with small ciphertext. But for the CPABE, you're going to require an additional assumption of the following form. Let me just say that this assumption doesn't talk about Gaussian free images. So it's uh, incomparable to the evasive out of assumption. It also doesn't talk about the function f. It's just about uh, you know, uh, axis. All right, so that's basically the entire talk. Uh, to conclude, uh, I, uh, I described new construction of broadcast encryption and CPAB and new lattice assumptions. I think that's a bunch of very nice open problems, whether you are a uh, crypt analyst working on a text, a lattice person working on lattice reductions, or someone working on uh, new lattice-based crypto systems. So uh, it would be great to see more crypt analysis and attacks on the assumption, or maybe reductions to the LW assumption for maybe a uh, specific distributions fee, ideally the ones that matches what we need for applications. And also maybe try to find new applications for this new assumption. So right, so in the work of uh, Strawberry disappearing at uh, Crypto 2022 and uh, independent work, uh, we showed that you can build witness encryption from this assumption, uh, slightly subtle version of this assumption. And finally, can you build CPABE from just evasive out of E without needing this uh, extra assumption about you know uh, that's a bit on the previous step. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay, we have plenty of time for questions. Oh. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm curious to know that, is it possible to extend this idea to key policy attribute based encryptions? Uh, so this extend this idea to? Key policy attribute. Ah, I see, okay. So key policy problem was solved in the, uh, that was the punchline of my uh, Euro Crypt Bomb session talk 10 years ago. Yeah, so the key policy version, sort of you get the right parameters and then, you know, with the follow-up work of uh, Bonnier et al, you get the right parameters. Uh, the the CPAB with large cipher text size basically is the construction you get when you uh, translate LKPABE to a CPABE using universal circuits. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, hey, any other questions? Okay, so let's thank Hutak again.